veteran NBA reporter Howard Beck joins the Rich Eisen show. And Howard, are, are we shocked by the move? Did were Phoenix always seem to be, you know, in contention for the Bradley for in the Bradley Bill trade? But what are we thinking that's going to hold this up, or will this all finally get pushed all the way through? Well, it seems pretty clear it's going to go through. The only question is whether they might expand the deal. We've seen this in the past mm. um, with several different deals, and in fact, we saw it. Another Wizards deal a couple of years back involving their other all-star guard at the time, um, Russell Westbrook, that deal eventually was expanded <laughs> right. when they were uh, sending him to the Lakers. And so um, if I'm recalling that one correctly, yes. I'm, I'm maybe uh, conflating that with another one. And the Anthony Davis one actually several years ago was like this too. You come to terms on the, the, the principles of a deal. And then if you have to, no particular urgency and they've got some time here before Chris Paul's, you know, they've got their contract, uh, guarantee date that they're coming up on but they've got a little bit of time before that often will then search the league somebody else can participate in the deal if, for a different variety of reasons in this case for one specific one which is that the wizards have no use for chris paul at this stage of his career right he certainly i'm sure would li like to land somewhere else the clippers obviously are the team mentioned most often and if you can find a way to in involve a third team and if you're Washington, maybe extract even more assets in a three-team deal than you would in a two-team deal. There's certainly incentive to do that. Sometimes there are cap savings involved or trade exceptions involved. Sometimes you're just trying to get a few more picks somehow in, in, involved in the deal. So you're going to do your diligence um, and, and see where that leads. In terms of surprise, I mean, the only thing I'm surprised about is, is that the Suns were this aggressive to get Beal in the first place because right. I just don't think it's the right move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can say that. I was looking at the roster this morning, and it's Beal, Booker, Durant, Aiden, I think one more player, and that's it. They don't even have a full roster yet. So what are they? do they even have enough to even put around them? Because they look like Howard, they're right in the same situation that they were in during the playoffs this past season. A great starting five, but there's nobody to really come off the bench and be a contributor. Yeah, and, and this is why I, I also just caution people not to judge the deal too harshly yet. Like, I will judge it based on the fact that I don't think Bradley Beal was the right move for them at all, mm, right. and I think it may exacerbate some of the issues that you just listed. But overall, we can't really judge what the Suns will be and all these question marks until the rest of the offseason plays out, right? Like, I, I think they're probably going to trade DeAndre Ayton and bring back multiple pieces, and that will help replenish some of the depth that they badly need. We're as we sit here right now, you're wondering, well, who's their point guard? Or are they going to go without a point guard? And it's just some combination of Beal and Booker and Durant handling the ball. That has its own implications, but maybe they're going to go get a point guard. Uh, if they're trading DeAndre Ayton, who's the new starting center, they already had just a, a you know bereft bench in the playoffs, as you noted, and it was part of why they lost when they did. And so they've got time to figure all that out. The problem is the combination of their new big three, and call it a big four for the moment if you want to throw Aiton in there. <laughs> right. Those four guys are making $162 million combined. The projected salary cap for next season is 134 The projected tax line is 162 So they're already at the projected tax line with just four players. And, you know, as you, I'm sure, are aware, like the new CBA comes into effect at, on July 1st and makes it far more difficult to keep adding players once you have hit these so-called aprons. And so this is the wrong time to be all in with, you know, multiple max guys, including one in Bradley Beal, who can't even stay healthy. Mm, veteran reporter and host of the NBA Locked On podcast, Howard Beck joining the Rich Eisen show. And look, Howard, I was just thinking about, you mentioned DeAndre Ayton. And I don't know if because of what the Denver Nuggets did just in, in winning the NBA Finals, and the way that Jokic played. Is there a resurgence of trying to keep a DeAndre Aiden more so? Or is it just what Jokic presents, teams are just going to have to figure it out because you're never going to have a big man who can actually guard Jokic or give you the key minutes that you need. So it's just either outscore the Denver Nuggets, who don't seem like they're going anywhere, or to try to find a center who can try to at least slow Jokic down. Yeah, I don't know what the answer to the Jokic puzzle is, and I don't think too many teams do right now, and that's part of why the Nuggets are champions. Yeah. Uh, but for everybody in the Western Conference 
or anybody with championship aspirations. I just, I think it's part of your calculus, but it's not the whole thing. Right. I remember, you know, when, when Shaq and Kobe were winning championships uh, at that time, I was covering the Lakers. A bunch of teams were loading up on bigs, not because they thought they had anybody who could stop or slow down Shaquille O'Neal, but just they just, you know, they want a, a, a bunch of different guys that could throw at him with different styles and physicality and more fouls to spend, whatever. So I've seen that in the past where a single player will cause everybody to go into the offseason with the thought in mind of, well, now, now this is the guy we're chasing. How do we deal with him? Uh, look, I don't, I don't know that there is an answer there. You know, like Joel Embiid is probably the only guy who's going to, to present a real challenge at both ends to Jokic on a consistent basis. And, it, you know, the teams are going to have to find other ways to deal with the Nuggets, and the Nuggets aren't just Jokic. They're, you know, Jamal Murray and Aaron Gordon and Michael Porter Jr. and, and the rest. And so it's more about the, the, the totality of the, the Nuggets' offense and the way Jokic leverages all of his teammates that makes them so effective. So, you know, I think push comes to shove. I think if you're the Suns, you're the Suns you'd, you'd rather still have the under Aiton, but there right. are questions about just his overall makeup before any of this, and now there are salary cap issues to boot and depth issues on top of it all. So I, I just think the only practical way forward, Jokic or no Jokic, is to trade your starting center, DeAndre Ayton, and break up his $32 million salary into multiple pieces because you need to find another way to fill out your roster now. Yeah, you're trying to fill out a roster, but then there's other teams who are trying to still draft players to figure out their roster as well. And I think about this week. It's like NBA draft week, right? Everybody's excited about what the draft may bring you as a as a franchise. We all know that San Antonio Spurs are going to take Victor Wimbanyama. And the expectations are there. One of the most highly uh, sought after or one of the best prospects we've seen since LeBron James. And I always say this, when you have those types of expectations, there's a lot that has to happen. What will the San Antonio Spurs get in Victor Wimbanyama? But, Wimbanyama, but more importantly, what does this mean for them in terms of going getting a title, get building a franchise around him to where they could be a consistent or a consistent contender year in and year out. Way too early to talk about them as a contender, although not too early to think about the fact that Victor Wembanyama will make that possible. Mm. I mean, everybody in the league is in love with this guy. Um, it's not just that he's well over seven feet with guard skills and, and really fluid too. Um, it's that his, Love for the game is apparent. His character, everybody believes, is, is very high. Um, he's engaging. He's got a personality. And, look, we've seen all kinds of players come along in recent years that we refer to as, as you know, these so-called unicorns, guys who are at or, or above seven feet or, or within, you know, 6'10 to 7 feet range with guard skills. And some of them move better than others, right? right. Some, you know, you know, think of a guy like, Giannis moves really well, but Giannis right. isn't a shooter. Correct. Um, you know, Kristaps Porzingis, who Durant named the unicorn, was kind of awkward in the way Porzingis moved, even before his knee injury. Wembenyama is as tall as Porzingis, but moves as fluidly as Kevin Durant does, and shoots way better than Giannis does. Um, he just he has everything. He has ball handling skills. He has range. Um, like he like he's a guy you invent. Uh, in in I, you know I don't know if you could do, go to that far in NBA 2K. I'm not a video game guy, but like <laughs> yeah. he's a guy you you would invent, right? right? Um, I'm going to make a guy who's 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 got guard skills, but he's he's a seven footer and can block mm -hmm. shots and, and can cover every inch of the court. Yeah. That's Wembenyama, and the Spurs are getting him. Yeah, we call them the creative players, right? You create them, <laughs> just just put them all the way together, Howard. So, uh, the the one thing that I'm hearing about a former number one overall pick in, in Zion Williamson, chatter in New Orleans that. Possibly he's for, trying to force his way out or the trade discussions for Zion Williamson. Is it obviously the injury history is something that you just can't predict, but it has been a key to why the Pelicans haven't been good over the last couple seasons. But is there really a possibility of trading Zion Williamson, you think, to get one of these top draft choices uh, to come in on, on Thursday? Hard to say. Um it's it's interesting considering that Zion's a former number one overall pick. Yeah. Considering that at the time he was picked, we were talking about him as being possibly the best pick since LeBron James. <laughs> um, and given that when he has played, he has played at an absolutely just incredible level, a dominant level. For a guy with that profile, I will nevertheless say this: 
I don't know what his trade value is, and I'm not sure wow. across the league if you could get a consistent feel for what his trade value would be because he's on a, a, a max deal paying him well over, I think, $240, $250 million. Um, He's, you know, injured for two-thirds of every season of his career so far. Uh, he's now got some off-court stuff that we don't need to go into that right. I think just casts some more doubts about his judgment and his maturity. Correct. And, I, I, I listen, if you're the Pelicans, I would I could totally see the motive in wanting to trade him for somebody more reliable. Um, you've got other good players in Ingram and C.J. McCollum and Herb Jones and, and this, this young group of players that I think have a lot of promise, and maybe you just want to move forward. But if you're another team out there, you know you're taking on all the risks that the Pelicans are now trying to shed of whether or not Zion will stay in shape, of whether or not he'll stay healthy, of whether or not he'll you know, conduct himself in a way that, that, uh, that doesn't make the franchise cringe. And so I don't even know how you assess his total value. If you put him out there right now in the market, and it's not too clear how aggressively they're doing that, I, I think you'd find a wide range of what uh, teams would say he's worth. And I think there are probably some that would say, you know what, given how – expensive he is and how much risk is associated i think there are teams that would probably say you know what i'd, I'd rather just you know steer clear do my own thing yeah just stay away uh veteran nba reporter howard beck host of the locked on nba podcast joined the rich eyes and so just a couple more questions for you howard just because uh we know victor Wembanyama will be the one overall pick the first selection on thursday who's number two and what does the draft sort of look like when you get from two through five, two through six? Anybody else stand out that possibly we could be talking more about after Wimbanyama? The, the two guys who are, you know, next in line are Scoot Henderson, who was playing for the G League Ignite. That's right. their development straight from high school. In fact, high school to do that. Uh, and Brandon Miller, um, forward from Alabama. Like, those are the two guys that that is weighing at number two. It's not clear where Charlotte's going there or if Charlotte might move that pick, which then will affect Portland because Portland is at number three, and they have a decision to make. They have multiple decisions to make. <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, because <laughs> they have to decide, are they trading the pick, whoever it may be, for immediate help to try to keep – to try to, uh, you know, get Dame Lillard a, a decent supporting cast in the near term. Um, or would Portland keep the pick? Would they trade Dame? Or would they keep the pick and and say, you know what, we'll just bridge the gap between the youth and, and Dame, and we'll just figure it out? I, like it, it's there's a thousand questions of, about the Blazers alone, and then it it keeps getting stranger because the Rockets are at number four, and they've already got a bunch of young players projects. <laughs> Um, there's every indication they're trying to now turn this thing around. They're 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 done with their tanking phase, or at least they'd like to believe so. And so they want to win, and they're they're aiming to, to start winning immediately. Well, another 19- or 20-year-old isn't going to help you immediately. And the Pistons are at number five, and they're in the same position as the Rockets in, in terms of wanting to turn the corner. And another 19-year-old, again, 19-year-olds don't usually get you immediate wins in the NBA. So, um, and then, you, you know, you jump down to, to seven. The Pacers are, are, are said to have be shopping that pick. Um, there's just a lot of fluidity, I think, in this draft uh, because uh, there's a lot of teams that I don't think necessarily want to be exactly where they are or, or might want to trade down or trade out. Yeah, I feel like it's like the AAU portion when it comes to the Rockets and the Pistons and all of that, just a bunch of young guys going out there, and hopefully they change things around. But last question for you, Howard, before I let you go is – you mentioned Dame Lillard. He's one of those big names that possibly could be dealt. Um, Chris Paul in this trade for Bradley Beal could be a buyout situation, which makes him a free agent. How do you see Chris Paul, who I think is the biggest name, but does have uh, at least a, a bit of contribution left in him for a franchise that thinks that they can win a world championship? How do you see Chris Paul, this situation for him? Uh, how does it, How does he handle it? Well, his family's still in L.A. Um, and has been ever since his Clipper days. And I, I think probably Chris Paul is going to try to do everything possible to get as close to L.A. as possible or back to L.A. Uh, maybe the Clippers get in on this this trade with the Wizards and Suns and he lands there anyway. Um, maybe he ends up somewhere else. And, you know, he does have 
it's a it's half of his 30 it's it's like 31 million on his contract and like right. 15 million is guaranteed so if they waive him I, the date's coming up in a week or so if you waive him um then the team is only on the hook for for the half of, of the salary and then he's free to go somewhere else i think if i had to guess one way or another he's going to find his way back to la um <laughs> Probably the Clippers, although I think it'd be interesting if, if the Lakers wanted to chase him. He and LeBron James, of course, are very close. And, you know, uh, you know, there's there will be options for Chris Paul. It's just at this stage of his career, and he's clearly shown signs of, of wear and slowing down. Um, you know, it, it's got to be a team that feels like they're, you know, not a piece away, like a superstar piece away, but a, a, a Chris Paul leadership slash playmaker away from, uh, from something, you know, he's not going to a rebuilding situation. He's not going to mid tier teams. Those don't make sense. Got to be a team that thinks it has a path to, you know, a, a top four seed. And I think more likely than not uh, as close to LA as possible. Well, we do know it is a busy next couple of weeks when it comes to the NBA draft, free agency, summer league, and somebody who will have it all covered for you, the host of the Locked On NBA podcast, veteran NBA reporter Howard Beck. Man, appreciate the time, Howard. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.